This is Eitan Weinstein. And I'm Naor Menninger. And you're listening to Two Nice Jewish Boys. For the last year, ever since Joe Biden became president of the United States, there's been a tremendous effort on the part of the U.S. to renew the deal between them and Iran, to rejoin the JCPOA, to revive the dying legacy of Biden's former boss and ideological forefather, President Barack Obama. How much will the U.S. be willing to concede? How likely is it that a deal will ultimately be signed? And will such a deal stop Iran from obtaining nuclear arms? Well, to answer all this and more, we are joined by, you guessed it, our dear friend, the no-filter owner of the most glorious mustache, Dan Shiftan. Dan is the head of the National Security Studies Center at the University of Haifa. He has taught at the IDF National Security College and Command and Staff College. He was an advisor to Israel's National Security Council and former prime minister's Yitzhak Rabin, and Ariel Sharon. He's also the author of several books and articles on issues pertaining to Israel's national security. And he joins us today for the third time to talk about the Iranian threat. Isn't it We're the fourth th- time, though? I don't think so. Is it the fourth time? I think it's the fourth time. Who we can shall... keep count at what this a... point? Who can keep count? <laughs> yeah. We're thrilled to be joined by you. Thank you so much. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Before we get to all that, we want you guys to ask yourself a little question. All right. Think about the last two years and what have you done? You know, other than conference calling with your Uncle Jeff, what have you really done to change your life? Well, if you're listening to this podcast, you're likely interested in Israel and you probably have hopes to travel here soon. Lucky for you, we've got the scoop on Masa Israel journey. Okay, you guys have to check these people out. Masaisrael.org. With they have an amazing range of life changing opportunities in Israel. Masa has so many different programs. They got gap year programs, they have academic programs, internships, volunteering, career programs. And the pandemic didn't stop them either. Promoting options to study remotely while living in Israel, Masa is just giving you the opportunity to change your life. You don't need to be fluent in Hebrew. You don't need to break your bank account. They even supply partial funding. So make a positive impact on the world, fuel your passion, make your travel dreams a reality. Go to MasaIsrael.org and find out more. So, um, on, on, are we doomed? Yeah, that's a good question to start with. <laughs> there is a German proverb and very well <laughs> translated into Yiddish saying, God gives problems, God gives shoulders. We have enormous problems and we have shoulders to match. In other words, on the one hand, Israel is facing major challenges, among other things. You mentioned Biden and the American administration. Every time they do something foolish and you think it can't be any more cut off from reality, they come up with a new um, item. But we have the shoulders, we have the response. Israel is in a new reality and it's very interesting. We're meeting today, Sunday, and we're having a conference in Sdebokel where Israel for the first time is presented as a full-fledged regional power. We were for a very long time a regional power in terms of our military capabilities, economic capabilities, technological, scientific, and so on. But now we're also working with the Arabs, and you have not an Arab-Israeli conflict, you have an Arab-Israeli coalition vis-a-vis the United States. This is what is happening tomorrow in Sdebokel. So our leeway, our room to maneuver in the region is enormously enlarged, and things are only getting better in this response. If I may, I don't know if it's okay, you want to come with specific questions. May I give you an overview of what I think is happening here? In 1979, when Israel and Egypt signed the peace agreement, we were 
at the end of the beginning of the Arab-Israeli conflict, because the most important Arab country left the Arab consensus, the Arab war pass against Israel, and we could deal with the rest of the Arab world because Egypt was not there. Now we have the end of the beginning, I'm sorry, now we have the beginning of the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict because we no longer have Israel on the one hand and the Arabs on the other, as we used to have for a very long time. We are having Israel and the Arabs against Iran. We are having Israel and most Arab states very worried about American policy and trying to convince America that it's going in the wrong direction. We have in the region the kind of possibilities that we couldn't dream for years that we would have when this, not only the Egyptians and the Jordanians are with us, but the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, the Moroccans, I don't think about the Sudanese very much because they don't play a major role. But if you look at the rest of the Arab states, they're looking at it and saying, hey, it works. We can work with the Israelis. We can openly admit that we have military cooperation with them, intelligence cooperation with them. The deputy uh, foreign minister of Bahrain says in an interview, we're working with the Mossad. So the interviewer asks him, you're being sarcastic, aren't you? He says, no, we're working with the Mossad. We meet the head of Mossad very often. We work with the Mossad. We work with the Mossad. We work. Imagine this, only five years ago, let alone 20, 30, 50 years ago, when we can work with most Arabs, do we have very serious dangers? Yes, Iran is the most prominent. Do we have problems on the international level sometimes? Yes, but... Are we stronger than ever before as a regional power in the Middle East? Yes. So, are we doomed? Certainly not. Are we in a difficult position? Yes, we have always been. Basically, we, we've either been in a very difficult, very, very difficult, or difficult. No, we're in a difficult situation. The number one problem is that the next war, if it comes, will mean a major attack on the centers of population in Israel, and this will be more harmful to the population of Israel than anything since the 1948 war. This is a very serious problem. Iran, with that the possibility sounds... of having nuclear weapons or even nuclear immunity, is a very serious problem. But is Israel today a very strong country by every yardstick in spite of that? Yes. Are the Israelis very resilient? Yes. Will this be the beginning of the end of Israel, even the kind of war that I'm describing? Definitely not. But it sounds, I mean, because it's kind of, I'm getting mixed messages here. Because it does sound like the next conflict will be excruciatingly devastating. It Could it potentially be? Yes. It will definitely be very painful. Meaning mass casualties? Yes. And do, can you estimate, do you have any idea what it could look like, even if it's a wide it range? It would be good if we will speak in terms of hundreds. I don't think, I think it'll go beyond that. But you're talking about Gaza firing no, at no, us? No, 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 forget Gaza. Lebanon. Forget, forget Gaza. We're speaking about a war with Iran. Direct and war or with proxies? Including a direct confrontation with Iran. This is the possibility. I'm speaking about the worst case analysis. Mm -hmm. And the worst case analysis, which is realistic, is a combination of a confrontation with Iran and its proxies. And we're speaking about 150,000 projectiles only from Lebanon. Most of them are not accurate and cannot reach Tel Aviv, but many of them can. When you're throwing 150,000 stones, you don't have to be so accurate. Uh, yes, you do have to be accurate because the damage that they can do with thousands of them, if they're not accurate, not long range, not heavy payloads, is not very big. We've had it before, okay? okay. This will be worse. The consequences on the other side 
will be much worse. Lebanon will be devastated, okay? Uh, Iran will suffer in a very, very meaningful way. But we will have to sustain very serious casualties. Now, I hope we can deter this war. It is not a war that must happen. It's a war that can happen. But, and we have to prepare for it. But again, we have a lot of problems and we have huge shoulders. And one of the most important component of these soldiers, uh, shoulders is an enormous resilience by the Israeli people. But how, how can you conclude that? Because it's not like the Israeli people have ever been actually, um, I don't know, put to the, to, to, to the test right with such a the test was much more serious in 1948 uh, we lost 1% of our population that was a long time ago this was a long time ago and for a very long time the possibility of all the arab states making war with israel was enormously dangerous but it and was israel... always the front in the front yes the war the arabs have managed and many others have managed to take the war out of the battlefield. Wars today are waged from inside civilian population towards civilian population. Since our enemies are incapable of dealing with the Israeli military forces, since they know they will be defeated in the battlefield, they've taken the war out of the battlefield. This is what uh, ballistic missiles and rockets and other types of weapons made possible. And since they know that we not only care about our civilian population, but we also put a lot of limitations on ourselves when it comes to their uh, civilian population, they put their weapons in the midst of their civilian population, hoping that we will either not hit it because it may kill innocent bystanders, or that we will kill them and then it looks bad on television. And then we have a problem in Europe with public opinion, with... Yes, but we've survived these problems. We've had it. We've had it for decades. It's unpleasant, but we've survived them. Look, Israel gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. Life in Israel gets better and better and better and better. If you look at victory, the new kind of victory is cumulative. It is not like the Second World War that you end in a bunker in Berlin or on a battleship in the Bay of Tokyo and they sign the instruments of surrender. It is cumulative in the sense that you ask yourself, in a war of 100 years with the Palestinians, what happened to the Palestinian people? What happened to us? We have a very, very, very good life. It's get, it gets better and better. They have a terrible life and they have no way of getting out of it. So who's victorious? Let me give you a specific example. When the uh, confrontation in Gaza in 2014 ended, on this very moment, I was on Al Jazeera in Arabic. And the interviewer from Doha says to me, you see, now they're celebrating in Gaza and people in Tel Aviv are sour. I said, you know what? Let's have for the next 70 years what we had for the last 70 years. The Palestinians will suffer and celebrate, and we will have a good life, and we will be a little sour. I'm willing to accept it, okay? So if you look at the overall picture, what is the real yardstick? Let me give you another example. Everybody knows there'll be another war in the Gaza Strip because you have barbarians sitting in the Gaza Strip. Okay, called the Gazans or the strippers or the Gaza strippers or whatever you <laughs> want to call them. Okay, now, in spite of this fact, demand for apartments in Ashkelon went up 60%. You can't find a place around Gaza with people knowing there will be war. You're in the Middle East. What happens in the Middle East? Okay. What do Arabs do to each other? Forget the Israelis for a moment. What do Arabs do to each other? In Iraq, in Syria, in That's Lebanon, a racist, uh, in statement Yemen. You're no, making here. no. <laughs> this is an accurate statement that idiots call racist because they don't have an answer, then they call it racist. First of all, 
is it factually true or not? If it is factually true, I don't care what you call it. Play with words as much as you want, if you don't have a real answer. Okay? What do Arabs do to each other in the last hundred years? Everywhere in the region. In Yemen, in Libya, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Jordan. What do they do? They kill each other. They kill their neighbors, don't they? Right? Yeah. Now, what do you expect? That the Arabs will treat Jews better than they treat their own brothers? Speaking the same language? Having the same religion? <coughs> what do you expect them to do? But the When, Europeans also killed each other for many, yes. many centuries. Oh, thank you for bringing that up. Europe used to be a slaughterhouse. And the greatest achievement of recent generations is that the Europeans, in a process that started with the Enlightenment, or even before that, with, in, in the, uh, after the Middle Ages, they went to a system, to a philosophical system, that puts the individual in the center, anthropocentric, okay? And this system, with the development of democracy and pluralism and so on, produced Europe as a peaceful, um, a free country where people have a good life. Until the so, Second World War. No, since the Second World ah, War. Since It Second. used to be a slaughterhouse until the Second World War. And in Western Europe, Putin is now trying to change it on the eastern part of Europe. But in Central and Western Europe, what used to be a slaughterhouse, think of a 30 years war, for instance, one of the worst things you can possibly imagine. The Europeans found their way out of it. Yeah, the but I Arabs think something, dig it deeper and deeper. It's true, but I think that when the West goes against the West, it's much more devastating than when the Arabs so go what? against the Arabs. So what? The West stopped going against each other, so why is it devastating? Until the next time, right? Which we're seeing right now with, no, with Putin. No, no. What we are seeing is a completely different culture. Russia is not a part of it, never was. Never was. People who believed Russia is a part of it were wrong. How so? Because it's a profoundly different culture. Because the Russian people are satisfied living in the 19th century when it comes to areas out of St. Petersburg and, and Moscow in terms, for instance, of the medical treatment that they're giving as long as they have a big military and they're considered a big power. Putin would have won the elections even if he did not poison his opponents. I don't know if he would have had the same kind of majority, probably not, but he would have won it because there is something wrong about the culture of Eastern Europe. You want to call it racist again because it makes sense and therefore it must be racist? Go ahead. I'm just trolling you're, you're, you. You're welcome. No, no, it's, it's okay. Uh, you don't need to provoke me. I'm provoked the moment yeah. I get up in the morning <laughs> and it's fun. You're provoked okay? by breathing yeah, uh, the yes, air. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Otherwise, it, it's very dull. But, but, so, but back to your uh, original point no, about no, no, let me just let, let me just say this. If you don't consider culture, you can't understand human behavior. If you're afraid of the word culture because immediately it conjures up the idea of, um, of racism, right. then you can't understand human behavior. If you assume, like Americans do, that in every Saddam Hussein there is a little Thomas Jefferson trying to come out, only he had a difficult childhood and therefore he is not responsible for the fact that he behaves like a barbarian. No, some people behave like barbarians. Look at Putin, okay? And it's again not because of his difficult childhood but because he comes from a culture that puts being a power above having a good life and trying to reach a, a, some kind of historic compromise with his opponents. Just a reminder that the U.S. ruled Western Germany for several decades and thus artificially creating or implementing... I don't like, care if it's artificially or not, as long as it worked. Look, you can... try to give people democracy as the Americans tried in Iraq and it would and, and it failed inevitably. It was stupid to even consider the possibility of bringing um, democracy to Iraq. You can try to bring women's rights to Afghanistan if you have it, an extremely developed sense of humor. okay If you're a complete idiot, you're trying to you can try and do it. 
And it never had any impact because the Afghanis didn't want it and the Iraqis didn't want it. But the Germans had it before Hitler and they wanted it back and it works. And the Japanese who didn't have it before wanted it and it works. Mm -hmm. And I'm not against it if you can persuade people to change their way. And there was a change of culture, particularly in Japan. In, in Germany, again, you had the infrastructure for it before. But, but you don't think that in, in Western and Eastern Europe there's any chance that things will boil no, to a... No, uh, you, you, you can try, and it worked very well in Central Europe. But I'm not surprised it worked in the Czech Republic and it didn't work in Belarus. No, I'm saying you're not, you wouldn't, you, you don't, you, you put it out of question that Europe will, uh, will basically uh, erupt again. War. Look, nothing is out of the question. You can't believe that there is anything uh, out of the question if you're a Zionist. Because we have revolutionized the life of the Jewish people. I mean, here is a tiny minority in the Jewish people 150 years ago that revolutionized the Jewish people. So can you change a political culture? Of course. Look, very close to us in Turkey, we had two major changes in political culture. One with Ataturk 100 years ago, and then with Erdogan in the wrong direction much later. So can things go back? They did in Turkey. They can in other places. I don't see it going back because it took very, very deep roots in Europe. I don't think it can uh, change in Europe again in the foreseeable future. But what I'm saying is, on the one hand, cultures can change. On the other hand, if you disregard cultures, you, don't, you can't understand anything. Mm -hmm. So back to the war uh, that we, we will have. So you say that Israel can be resilient and that Israel... I'm not saying we will have. I mean, we could have. We could eventually, I mean, it's almost in one way or another. Okay, so let's get, get back to the Iran question because it seems like um, basically the U.S. is throwing us under the bus. In, in one hand, they are giving everything to Iran and... They're and capitulating it, to Iran. And, and making the war, this war almost inevitable on no. in one hand. No. And on the other hand, they give us uh, funds, and they give us aid, Look, they give us... Americans are very, very often wrong about understanding the world. Let me give you an example of somebody who did exactly the same thing that Biden is doing today. Eisenhower, 1956. Instead of saying, here is a local radical enemy of the United States and the West. And the French and the British have volunteered to hang him on a lamppost. Let's help them hang him on a lamppost. What are we talking about? 1956, Gamal Abdel Nasser, yes. the radical anti-American leader of Egypt. Okay. The United States, being as foolish as they are today, as completely disconnected from Middle Eastern reality and completely misunderstanding anything about this region, said, here are pro-American forces in the Middle East and here is an anti-American force. Let us support our enemy because then our enemies and our friends will join together and we'll ride together in the sunset, into the sunset and live happily ever after. Completely misunderstanding that a radical you must break and humiliate, because the only way the moderates can survive is if the radicals are broken. And Gamal Abdel Nasser, with the assistance of Eisenhower, dominated the Middle East for 20 years and created enormous calamity, not only for American interest and Israeli interest, but for Arab interest for 20 years, because the, the uh, American president was so dumb in 1956. And it took Johnson and Nixon and Kissinger to correct the mistake of Eisenhower by breaking uh, Nasser and making the Middle East less unstable. I don't want to say stable Middle East. I don't think it is allowed when it comes to syntax, okay? But making the Middle East much less unstable and trying to bring some kind of relative stability into the region. Now you have a very strong Iran with a very weak Arab world. The Arab world is aware of its weakness. 
Iran is a combination, very dangerous combination, of an extremely capable people with a barbaric leadership. We've seen it in Europe in the 1930s that this combination of a very able people with a barbaric uh, leadership can be extremely dangerous. And this is what the Iranians want. And the Iranians want to dominate the Middle East. And if they dominate the Middle East oil and the Middle East religious element and they, they dominate Mecca and the oil and the gas and the waterways of the region and so on, then they threaten Europe and they threaten the whole world in a way. So I okay? give them everything they want. Because you're stupid. Stupidity <laughs> explains 90% of human behavior, not only when it comes to politics, because you're stupid. And what explains the other 10%? Well, <laughs> various I, things. I'm not sure. Drugs. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So, okay? but it, uh, no, no, just to, to yeah. uh, complete this, this argument. So, if you have the Iranians that will dominate the Middle East, if they're allowed to do so by the United States and the Europeans, but the Europeans at the moment are secondary, then Israel will be in an unacceptable situation. Then the threat to Israel will be existential and Israel will prevent it, regardless of American policy. How? Ameri Israel, first of all, Israel is the only one that is willing to fight the Iranians. We are fighting them now. We are engaged in a preventive war against Iran in Syria, in Western Iraq, and in an undeclared way in Iran itself. Okay? We are trying to undermine Iran, and we are willing to fight Iran. The Arabs look at the United States and say we can't trust the Americans. They look at the Israelis and we say the only people we can trust are the Israelis. Israel is much less important than America, but much more reliable than America. And closer. And therefore, you have an Arab-Israeli alliance that to a large extent is against American policy. Okay? Because American policy is to capitulate to Iran at the expense of the Arabs and the Israelis. And the Arabs and the Israelis can combine forces against this American policy, waiting for America to come around. This is the paradox. On the one hand, we are working against American policy. On the other hand, in the final analysis, we cannot do without America. So we wait for America to realize that its policy in Iran is a complete failure, that you cannot support your enemies and undermine your allies, which is basically what the United States did in 56 and is doing today. And finally, the Americans will come to their senses. This is what we hope. And we have to hold the fort against Iran, even when the Americans are on the wrong it, side. It seems like I mean, that's always kind of the case with the states, right? With the United States. It's like, it's like Sisyphus, right? Because you have this democracy. And you nev the problem with democracy is you never really know how foreign policy is going to pan out. Because on one one round they vote in a guy like trump and in another round they vote in a guy like biden who flips it on its head completely the problem is that your choice is between trump and biden what happens to a nation of 330 million people that this is the choice they can offer between <laughs> well, trump and that's biden. where we are no that's the problem but that's, that's not something the... you're going to change no but remember if you are trying to see things in historical perspective would the Ben Gurions and the De Gaulle's and the FDRs uh, and the Churchills of today be even be elected, or do you take somebody who's cool like? Uh, um, yeah, but are Obama we looking back or, nostalgically at these people? I mean, some of yes. the policies that FDR had were awful and horrible, and so. Some, so but, I'm saying, but most of them look. Nobody is perfect. If you're looking for perfection. Please don't discuss politics with me. No, but what okay? I'm asking, what I'm asking is, I mean, you mentioned also FDR Eisenhower. FDR was not awful. You I think FDR was one of the best things that happened to America, both domestically and finally also in foreign. Even policy. with the New Deal and yes, the, yes, yeah. no, particularly because of, look, if you start with the depression, if this is your reality, not today's America, okay, mm -hmm. or the America of the 1950s, think of America in the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. and find a better there could have been a better way but this at least is leadership but let me ask you this how do you deal in the Middle East with uh, a reality that is 
the United States dem- democratically elected leadership, which is foreign policy switches every Monday and Tuesday in geopolitical terms. So, like, how do you what What's the way forward? All, Just waiting for switch. the pendulum to swing. I, I I wish it would switch, but from uh, Obama and Biden, it seems to be a very similar policy, and therefore the wrong approach to practically everything. I think Obama was the worst president America had in foreign policy. since the Second World War, in foreign policy, I'm not judging domestic issues, mm-hmm. in foreign policy, because he basically gave up the unique role of the United States as the power that establishes the global order. Okay? And I think this is extremely dangerous, particularly vis-a-vis the Chinese alternative that is looming on the horizon. But Israel must take care of its own vital interest. It is delightful when you can do it with the Americans, but we did it very often not with the Americans and sometimes even against the Americans, okay? Mm-hmm. When there was no other way. In 1956, we did it against the Americans. In 1967, until we finally got the yellow light from Johnson, The Americans always also wanted to see if they can appease Gamal Abdel Nasser, okay? So Israel needs to ask itself what is absolutely vital for its survival, and when it can afford to wait until American com- America comes to its senses, then it will wait. And I think now it can afford to wait. But while we are waiting, we have to hit the Iranians. And we will hit the Iranians whether the State Department likes it or not. Okay. And, okay, let's, let's talk a bit about where Iran stands, how close they are to a nuclear weapon, and what it might mean to have a uh, nuclear Iran. Look, my concern is much more with the regional hegemony than with the nuclear weapon. The nuclear weapon is an instrument. It's an extremely important instrument, but it's, a, but, but it's an instrument. The American approach that is unbelievably narrow-minded and completely irrelevant to reality says the important thing is nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons is enrichment. Let us see if we can slow down enrichment, and this will prevent a nuclear weapon. Basically, the Americans even waited with the JCPOA until the Iranians got 100% of what they wanted concerning the ability of enrichment, okay? This was done very, very late. They waited until Iran had 100% and then came in the JCPOA. And then they looked only at enrichment. They didn't look at ballistic missiles. They didn't look at the weapons weapons. group they basically allowed the Iranians to do whatever they wanted in a way they gave them immunity to the other things because they focused only on one things this train has left the station the Iranians a can do it can do it very fast can do it very effectively this is not the issue today there is one question do you want a weak Iran trying to reach nuclear weapons or Or is strong Iran trying to reach nuclear weapons and America makes Iran strong it gives them hundreds of billions of dollars with these hundreds of billions of dollars they can promote their um, their nuclear ambitions their hegemony ambitions they can fix what is wrong domestically inside Iran this is the dumbest thing you can possibly do today you Civilized people have a zero-sum game with Iran. Whatever is bad for Iran is, is good for the civilized world. How, how is America giving today to the Iranians? By, by alleviating the sanctions. Try to make their life miserable. This is what you do to your enemy. You don't help your enemy. By the way, this is the same idiotic pass that the Germans took with the Russians. Okay? Nord Stream 1 with Schroeder, basically a traitor. to Germany that switches from being the Chancellor for working for Putin, okay? Then Angela Merkel, who used to be considered a leader in Europe until we realized they did, she did the worst things you can do for Germany. A, what she did with the um, refugees in 2015, and B, Nord Stream 2. So here you have Russia. Russia is an enemy. By the way, Russia was fighting a war against Western Europe even before Ukraine, through the cyberspace. 
This is a war trying to undermine Western societies. So what does Germany do? It becomes more and more and totally dependent on Russian gas. It makes Russia rich and it gives Russia a lever against Germany. And this is considered wise policy. I know that people like to be sophisticated. I'm sorry, I'm simple-minded. You have an enemy, make his life miserable. So, you, are, you have an ally, help him. This idea, we will help our enemies and undermine our allies, and this will bring peace, is the kind of approach, this is what Obama is about, mm -hmm. this is what Biden is about, this is what Merkel was about, and this is what brought us, among other things, the war in the Ukraine. So I want to get back to the Iranian nuclear issue, but if we're already on the Russian detour, what about Israel's stance with Russia and the fact that we're kind of flip-flopping? We're not flip-flopping. Meaning we're, we're unwilling to take a, uh, a concrete, make a concrete statement in support of either side? No, or... we have made a concrete statement in support so? of Ukraine against Russia. But we don't push it too far, and we shouldn't, because we depend on what the Russians can do to us in Syria and Lebanon. There is an existential interest of Israel. There is an existential need of Israel to fight Iran. And if it doesn't make us look very uh, rosy and beautiful in, to, to some people... Okay. My, the enemy of my enemy is my unwitting no, friend? No, that... no. I have Russia that could become an active enemy in Syria, and by becoming an active enemy will make it extremely difficult for Israel when it comes to an existential issue. And the question is, do I want to make him an active enemy in Syria? And I don't. So I will make less statements that mean nothing anyhow, and I will not threaten a vital interest an existential interest of Israel. But my issue there is that on one hand, we talk about, you know, being strong against your enemy and making your enemy miserable in order to serve as a deterrent and show your strength. Mm. And be, strength is the, the key to keeping peace, right? If you want to prepare for, if you want to have yes. peace, prepare for war. So on one R hand, we talk Russia about how America... is not an active enemy. It's for not. Us. Huh? For Israel. For Israel. Yeah, I mean, but it is in Syria. It, it is, is in it... Syria, and we don't like it. And it is in Syria because of Obama. Mm -hmm. Okay. They used to be our enemy for decades. It's yes. important to clarify. And when, like, uh... when they were our active enemies for decades, we were extremely careful because this is a superpower, or mm -hmm. used to be a superpower when we're speaking about the Soviet Union in the 1970s, that... We didn't want fighting directly against Israel, okay? You have existential interest. What is it on both hands here? On the one hand is an existential interest of Israel of fighting, Syria, of fighting Iran that Russia can make extremely difficult. And on the other hand, there are statements that doesn't mean very much one way or, the, or another, mm -hmm. okay? Why so, do Russians let us attack Iran in Syria? because they don't want the Iranians to be so strong in Syria because they want to be solely in control of Syria. So why do, you, do the Iranians let the Russians let us attack them because, in Syria? Because the Iranians can't do anything to the Russians. What would the Iranians do to the Russians? Okay? And also, look, we don't touch what the Russians appreciate more than anything else, which is Assad. And they don't touch what we appreciate more than anything else, namely our freedom of action in Syria. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, if you want to look good in the New York Times and you say, forget the vital interest of Israel's survival, we want to look good, then you make more statements that doesn't make a difference anyhow. Did we vote against uh, Russia in the UN? Yes. Did we make all the right statements? Yes. Did we send the hospital? Yes. Are we not uh, s celebrating it every day? Yes. And if somebody doesn't like it, let him not so, like it. I so don't care. If I can just like straighten it out. You're saying that you do, agree, you do think that curtailing Russia's efforts in Ukraine is maybe the right, uh, the end goal, but it's not our end goal, meaning no, it's not something I'm for us to is, do. Putin is defeating Russia in the Ukraine in a major way. 
Is defeating the, Russia in the U.S.? It's de- defeating Russia. It's the worst decision anybody has taken okay, in that's many, many, many years, what okay. Russia is doing. Because he says, which is a joke, and when Mersheimer supports this joke, he probably has a great state of a sense of humor, is that Putin did it because of NATO. NATO was fading away until Putin revived it. You should have a statue of Putin in the headquarters of NATO in Brussels. He's the best thing that ever happened to NATO. Now Finland Putin. wants to join. Huh? Finland yes. wants to join. Finland wants, yes. Well, with the Finns joining, I don't think the alliance will become much stronger. <laughs> but, They did fight uh, but, the Nazis yes, uh, in the I forests. Know. So. I know, I know, and it's nice and I'm for it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But the important thing is it revitalized NATO. It revitalized the Atlantic um, alliance between the United States and Canada on the one thing and, and Europe on, on the other. The Germans have more than doubled their, um, their uh, defense uh, uh, spending from 47 to 100 billion euros. Today I read that the Germans want to purchase aero missiles from Israel. It would make a lot of sense. Why not purchase from yeah. the best? And I thought to myself, okay. oh... Yeah. Times are changing. Times, they are changing. Yeah. Yes. Yes, they History are. has a funny way. Yes, of, uh... they are. History has a funny way. Yes. Yeah. And no, this is in- extremely important to understand. Mm-hmm. Putin is digging a grave to himself and to Russia, which is huge. Okay. And you think it will be determined if the Israelis say whatever they say only once a day, they will say it five times a day. Mm-hmm. So somebody in, 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 in uh, the progressive Americans will be more happy. So, I don't care. No, but I, I, I'm, I meant more actual support. I'm wondering if it's in our interest to send actual support to Ukraine. What do you mean actual? Military? Like, yeah, military support. You must support. be an idiot if you're yeah. even considering <laughs> it. Okay? How so? Okay. Do you want... The, the Russians, who can militarily disrupt even what the Israeli Air Force does over Israel, let alone over Lebanon and over Syria, okay? If you are actively fighting Russia and they're actively fighting you, what will the Russians win and what will the Israelis win? Or, or more important, what will the Russians lose in the Ukraine? Almost nothing. And what will Israel lose in the Middle East? Enormous. Look. And more generally, what, is, what should the West's response be there? So again, the West has different parts, okay? okay. The, the most U- important is, of course, the United States. Mm-hmm. The second most important is changes inside Europe vis-a-vis NATO, particularly spending for defense. If the Europeans now start spending for, for defense like the Germans... This is perhaps the most important change we've seen in Europe since the collapse of the Soviet Union, perhaps even since the Second World War. And that's a, a product of the, the, the war in the Ukraine. So mm-hmm. do you want me to lament it? It is great. It is tremendously important. Look, there is something fundamentally happening to people in Europe who finally understand that evil exists. Okay, that you can have somebody like Putin. They, they forgot. When I was speaking about Putin's uh, danger to Europe, people on very high level in Western Europe were laughing at me. Okay, for even suggesting it. This is you're coming from the past. Okay, the past is catching up with us in the Ukraine. Okay, so. We should see the big picture rather than pick on this or that that mm-hmm. somebody doesn't like and it doesn't look good. Look, if somebody looks good, it's probably the wrong move. Okay? Okay, so, I mean, how do you suggest the West move forward? Just by investing more in NATO and, and investing more... Let me put it this way. Yeah. The fact that Putin did what he did was to a large extent a product of the weakness of the United States and Europe, okay? He realized there is nobody sitting in the White House since Obama, okay? So once in a lifetime he, opportunity to make his dreams come true. And he realized that there is no NATO 
that NATO is an empty framework. So, are we to blame for uh, Russia's decision to an extent? Yes. Of course, he should be blamed 100%, but we can take 20% later after he is blamed 100%. Since the war already broke out, I think that what the West is doing now is correct. In other words, it is correct not to engage in a war in, in the Ukraine, for instance, not to make it a no-fly zone. And here America is using the same yardstick, and rightly so, that Israel is using in Syria and Lebanon. Namely saying, here is an existential question, namely, do you want a nuclear war to be more possible with Russia? And here is something that will save people to an extent, but will not change things fundamentally. So America is taking the, the correct approach. Mm. Is it also the correct approach not to fly in jets from Poland into, uh, into the Ukraine? Yes. And again, for the same kind of reasoning that I mentioned Israel having before. Because if you, have, if you are at war with a country and another country becomes involved in, involved in it by sending aircraft, and this country is a part of NATO, where an attack on one of the NATO members means an attack on all of them, you are starting here that you don't know that you can stop when you want to stop it, okay? It can get out of control. So I think both... But, we, but the, the plan was to just supply the U Ukraine with jets, right? How do you b get the jets to... So they were worried about jets being shot down as they were no, being flown no, in? No, no, no. If the jets take off from NATO territory, yeah. flying into the Ukraine then the basis inside NATO from which the aircrafts took off is a legitimate military target. Mm. Do you want to risk it? Mm. I wouldn't. Okay? Would it make a dramatic difference? But isn't about... that true for any... I mean, we are supplying... The People are supplying no, arms, right? No. The, yes, but they're supplying it in a way... There's a difference between aircraft that have to take off from a certain place that you can easily identify and ours that come in one way or another. Okay? okay? I think the balance is a good balance, giving them a lot of anti-tank um, missiles, giving them a lot of um, anti-aircraft missiles for low-flying uh, mm -hmm. aircraft. Okay, it's it's not a system that goes to the very high parts. The stinger it, it, and the javelin. Yeah, the, yeah the, the, the stinger and the javelin are very good, very, very good choices. So, and, and the sanctions, of course. Mm -hmm. And whatever is bad for Russia, there is only one yardstick. If it's bad for Russia, it's a good thing. Okay? Let's get back to, to Iran. Uh, I have two questions. First, do, do you think there's any chance that the deal will collapse, that there won't be a deal eventually? I'm praying. I don't know how much my prayers are heard upstairs, but I'm praying. I wish there will be something wrong that will uh, destroy it. I don't see it coming. The Americans are willing to capitulate so badly yeah. that they're willing to consider taking the um, the uh, revolutionary guards out of the terrorist list. Look, there has never been in human history a terrorist organization of the magnitude of the revolutionary guards and their affiliates, okay? They have a global stretch. Nobody, Nazi Germany, Stalin, didn't have anything similar to what the Iranians have. And these guys tried to kill the Saudi ambassador in Washington, okay, in a restaurant in Georgetown. So we're speaking about terrorism. There is nothing more terroristic in the world. Nobody deserves to be on the terrorist list if the Revolutionary Guards are off the terrorist list. The very fact that America is contemplating it is capitulation to the um, Revolutionary Guards, not even to Iran, to the Revolutionary Guards. If you don't work against the Revolutionary Guards, you support them. Okay, this is the meaning of what the United States. If Biden said. could revive Hami. Uh, what what what's uh, his name? Ni. If yeah, he could, he, he would. would have resurrected. <laughs> he should okay? add it as a because because uh, uh, Trump did it. So yeah. re uh, resurrecting him would be an obligation of a progressive. Right. I hoped very much that Biden would not be like Obama. I 
was encouraged in the beginning when I saw that the progressives did not get a major uh, position in foreign policy. I'm sorry to say that whatever seems to happen now, and I still hope it will fail, leads to complete capitulation of the United States to Iran. And wait, and my follow-up question is, do you think Israel should have been more aggressive uh, Look, speaking against we tried what the US is doing? We tried to be extremely aggressive. I mean, Netanyahu in Congress. Yes. And extremely non-aggressive. And both failed. The United States is so committed to capitulation to Iran that Israel cannot impact it. The Americans know everything we've told them. They listen to us very carefully. You know, there is a nice T-shirt and it says, I'm multitasking. I can listen, ignore and disregard at the same time. <laughs> This is what the Americans did to us. They listened and completely disregarded us. Okay? But They have no response to... To what we are but saying. But why? Uh, stupidity, Because, okay, but why? Let's, uh, first when of all, you try stupidity to get... is something in its own right. You don't have to have anything in addition to stupidity. Again, Still, if you look try to at get Eisenhower into Biden's in, head. Look at Eisenhower in 56. Look at Jimmy Carter when it came to bringing the Russians back to the Middle East after Kissinger and Nixon got them out. You, there is no limit to stupidity. And Americans are trying to excel in every field, okay? <laughs> so I don't think you need anything more than the dumb notion that if you stop enrichment, then it technically puts the Iranians a bit further away from getting a nuclear weapon, and therefore we've done the job, okay? This is the narrowest kind of... of looking at reality that you can possibly imagine. This is the antithesis of strategic thinking. You see, I'm teaching strategic thinking. And the best way sometimes to explain a term is to explain its opposite. When I want to explain the opposite of strategic thinking, I'm saying, look at what America does with the JCPOA. So what happens when they have all the capabilities around a nuclear weapon and all they need is a little bit more enrichment and they can get there within how long? No time, right? It doesn't really matter. It doesn't because matter. Because they still have to perfect their ballistic, missile, their ballistic system. They still have the weapons group must uh, so I'm saying, fit it into... So let's say they finish everything around it. If they it, finish everything... What, can they, what kind of harm can they inflict on... Israel. They, Do the, we not have ways harm, to defend against the it? The harm will not be nuclear. Okay. The harm will be their perception that they have immunity. In other words, that they can dominate the Middle East and we cannot respond beyond a certain point because they are on the verge of having or are having nuclear weapons. This is mm. the important element. The idea is not they have a nuclear weapon, they drop it on Tel Aviv. This is a simple-minded approach mm -hmm. of doing it. Like we just saw with Russia, that's threatening with every other day, they threaten with the And nuclear weapons. And therefore, we're extremely careful. Yeah. Okay? You know how porcupines make love, right? With extreme caution. <laughs> okay? <laughs> This is what you do when you have a nuclear power. Okay? The point is not to let them get to this point. And the Americans have done everything wrong you can imagine for more than 20 years. Not understanding that there is a difference between barbarians getting nuclear weapons. I, would, I didn't mind when the Indians got it. But it's different with the North Koreans, the Pakistanis, and the Iranians. And the only ones that didn't have it for defensive purposes, but offensive purposes, are the Iranians. You see, both and the North, North Korea. No, the North Koreans have it for defensive purposes. They want to keep the regime in place. They're not about to attack Russia or Japan. Okay? Mm -hmm. The Pakistanis got it because they're afraid of the Indians. The Iranians want to dominate the Middle East. Mm-hmm. So okay. if you're Israel, what would you... The day after the deal is signed... First of all, I am Israel. What yes, of if, course. If you were Israel. Of course. Huh? But if you're, if you're the leader, huh? um, what, what would you do the day after the deal is signed? Look, the day after the deal is signed is perhaps next week. 
So in terms of being prepared for it, we are prepared for it now. What we are doing today is to cement our relations with the Arabs who can put pressure on the Americans. When the Americans come to the um, Emiratis and the Saudis and they say, we want to keep the price of oil low, so increase your production, you will make less per barrel, but it is for the general good, why don't you work with us? The Saudis and the Emiratis tell the Americans, you betray us with the Iranians and you expect us to help you with the oil prices. So, for the first time in history, Arab oil works for Israel. Okay? Because when America does not betray the Emiratis and the Saudis, they also don't betray Israel. By, again, supporting our worst enemy and undermining their best allies in the region. Bringing Egypt into it is important because what Israel is basically saying, look, everybody in this region that counts is on our side, not on the Iranian side. Even the Turks that are a very negative element, Erdogan, understands that when push comes to shove, he needs to have better relations with Israel and the Arabs because it goes together to a certain extent. And you are the only ones supporting our worst enemy and undermining us. Egypt is against what you're doing and it's the only anchor of stability in the region. Uh, the Saudis and the uh, Emiratis and the Bahrainis and potentially others have oil that can balance the price and bring it down when the Russians are, uh, when you want to hit the Russians where it hurts the most, namely when it comes to energy, to oil and gas. So try to work with your friends instead of your enemies. Yeah, but what do you do on the day like Iran gets more and more bold? Let's say one day so they do a, a drone, harder, a drone attack like we see in yes. Yemen. Let's say one day we have a drone attack on, I don't know, first of Eitan's all, office. They, first of all, they try to do it in Israel already. Yeah. Second, we are constantly, uh, they say, I don't know if it's true, I hope it is, that we destroyed hundreds of these right. drones in Iran. Right. They say, I hope it's true, that we are working in Iran to undermine whatever we can. Not only the nuclear project, but whatever we can. Right. They say we did it in Bandar Abbas, in the harbor, through cyber. They say we did it with the trains. I hope all of this is true. I would double it and double it and double it. Any kind of American-Iranian reproach should be uh, approach should be responded by more attacks on Iran, more attacks in Syria, more cooperation with the um, Bahrainis and the um, Emiratis, more Israeli presence in the Persian Gulf. Look, the Israeli chief of staff flies with an Israeli Air Force jet over Saudi Arabia to Bahrain, bringing with him the commander of the Israeli Navy, who comes in full Navy uniform. And this is probably not the only presence of the Israeli Navy in the Persian Gulf. Okay? And Israel should undermine this American policy. This is an anti-Israeli policy. How do you undermine the policy yeah. and still work very closely with the United States? A, we want it, B, they want it. And here let me uh, say something that is particularly important for American Jews. American Jews consider the relations between Israel and the United States as if it were a humanitarian project. Namely, the Americans like the Israelis and because they like us, they cooperate with us. Do we have common values? Yes. Is it important? Yes. But Israel is a major regional power and you don't push around a major regional power into a corner. So from an American point of view, 
they can benefit from us enormously because we're the strongest element in the Middle East, a pro-American element that is as strong as Israel, and the only ally of the United States that doesn't want American soldiers to fight for us. Everybody else says, we are in alliance with the United States, and when push comes to shove, American soldiers will save us. We are willing to deal with it ourselves. So, will the Americans say, we don't like what the Israelis are doing in Iran, and therefore we will not supply them with weapons? I don't think so. Because, is it really, do you really want to push Israel in a direction where the Israelis have a problem about defending themselves? I don't think so. Okay. So, so let me let me ask about uh, Israel's uh, activity on the Iranian fronts in the last year. Because a lot of the things you're talking about, like our relationships with Arab countries that used to be uh, unthinkable, are kind of the fruits of uh, previous leadership. And in the last year, we've been we've been under a new government, and I'm wondering if you see any difference in our activity in no. Iran and any difference. Look, in the way that we're dealing with the threat. The strengths threat. of Israel and the strengths of Israeli society is the major, almost exclusive reason why the Arabs are willing to deal with us. They don't say, oh, we like Netanyahu or we like uh, Bennett or we like uh, Lapid or something. This, this is a joke for Israeli domestic politics. This is not the issue. Israel is a very important regional power. Arabs must, they, we are the only ally they have that can actually fight, okay? The strongest army in the region is Israeli. The most determined country in the region is Israel. The uh, country that knows that it has an existential interest in fighting Iran is Israel, okay? We don't have a choice of being nice to the Iranians and then they will not kill us on weekdays, only on weekends or, or something, okay? So this is the most reliable and the strongest and the most determined element in the region. Yeah, but so that didn't happen out of the blue. I mean, it happened as a, as a consequence Trump of... Trump helped of, it. No, but it happened as a consequence of domestic, not domestic no. policy, but of domestic leadership that no. chose to invest in it. No, we, it, it's no thanks to Netanyahu invest, investing in defense. It is thanks to Netanyahu. In, okay. It is thanks to Netanyahu. Okay. And I think his very good relations with Trump and the willingness of Trump to invest in it as was the right thing to do from an American point of view, not from an Israeli point of view. From an American point of view, what Trump did was the right thing because Obama was obsessed with the Palestinians, because he has no clue. Obama is the most clueless person I've met. And here's the interesting thing. He's intelligent, he's sophisticated, and he's clueless. Okay? It's a very interesting... Obama is the kind of person I would like to have as a friend, as a neighbor, as a member of my PTA, up to the third grade approximately. Okay? He's a very nice guy only clueless about the world. He was wrong in everything he said. When he says in Syria, we have a red line about using chemical weapons, and then he is proudest more than anything else by saying, oh, it was a red line, but actually let the Russians do it. Okay, that's what he did. He brought the Russians to Syria and gave them the position they have in Syria to a very large extent. He was wrong in practically everything. So what do I want? Nice people being wrong or abhorrent people doing the right thing? But, but I'm asking if domestically our current leadership in any way weakens our stance against Iran. If, if for a long yes, term... Yes, yes. Look... These guys, first of all, have had very little experience in, uh, in politics on this level, okay? And they're learning. And look, for instance, we had Olmert. I think he was a good prime minister, but he's the one who messed up the, first Lebanon, the second Lebanon war. Mm -hmm. I remember telling him at the time, on the one hand, you messed up the war. On the other hand... Every Israeli prime minister can mess up one small unimportant war, okay? And it was a small unimportant war. But basically, he was a good prime minister. 
His decision to destroy the Syrian uh, reactor was heroic, but also very responsible. And a combination of heroism and responsibility is not easy. Okay, He did the right thing domestically in Israel, and he didn't have much experience. And in the beginning, he made mistakes. Oh, so what? Some people make mistakes because they haven't had political experience, and some people make mistakes because they've been too long in power. It also happens. You know that prime ministers and diapers, you have to change for the same reason after a while. Okay? So uh, it is uh, something that Israel is strong. This obsession with the personalities, you know, it's yeah. easy for people who don't understand strategic thinking because they say, oh, I like Ike or I don't like Schmeich or, or no, whatever. No, but strategic okay. thinking is within, is in the heads of the leaders. And if you have yes, a specific but leadership, Israel, but in then Israel, you, you might run into a problem. The security establishment in Israel is used to it, and uh, you have continuity. And by the way, when it comes to Iran, I don't know of any disagreement, of any major disagreement, significant disagreement in the Israeli um, security Establishment. Does it not cause any issues? The fact that the coalition now includes Arab parties is that no, is that no, presenting I don't any think kind it of... has even the slightest impact on Iran. Zero mm. impact on on Iran. Now again, would I prefer this guy or the other guy? Uh, yes, but that's not the point. I mean, we are confusing the kind of gossip, political gossip, that 90% of our media are dealing with. This is what they're dealing. They're dealing with political gossip. But in the end, the harm that you're speaking about from the United States' perspective is because of an elected leader that simply yes, changed but from this... Trump. The Trump's era was much more positive as opposed to Biden's, which all, the only difference was, I mean, First even though all, there's the a Trump's defense establishment. era was positive of some things and very negative on others. But I'm saying an for, era, a political era can change a lot, no? Yes. Look, but this is what happens in democracies. Mm -hmm. Okay? But what I'm saying is my problem, I don't have a major problem in Israel, neither with, um, with Netanyahu nor with Bennett and Lapid, because when it comes to what really counts, namely the Iranian issue, they are more or less in the same place. That the threat is so existential that yes, people can't I deny it? I don't think there is any significant disagreement among Israelis on Iran. By the way, there is very little disagreement even when it comes to the Palestinian issue when you go to the mainstream of the Israeli society. The Jewish yeah? Israeli society. The Israeli. What counts in Israel are the the electorate so i'm incorporating the arabs but even when you incorporate the arabs the mainstream of israelis understand so the arabs will be whining this is the national product whining complaints excuses okay not only in israel you forgot failures but, but in also failures but when you come to the mainstream of Israelis, do they really, does anybody really believe that a, a viable Palestinian state is now a realistic possibility and that you have a partner? 3% uh, here, 2% there, nothing, okay? The overwhelming majority of Israelis since the Second Intifada, mm -hmm. I'm not speaking about the period between 82 and 2000, but since the Second Intifada, we are more or less, when it comes to our major issues, we have much more agreement in Israel than uh, the, the media will show. For instance, in Israel, there is actually no discussion on socioeconomic issues. We have a few socialists that we keep in museums under glass covers so that the dust will not cover them. Okay, We have a few extreme capitalists and the overwhelming majority of Israelis want to take the welfare state a bit more to the right or a bit more to the left. They pretend to have disagreements for election purposes. Oh, we support the middle class, we support the workers or, or whatever. This is for electoral reasons. Most Israelis agree on practically everything that counts which is now demonstrated with this government that has the deep right and the deep left in the same government 
and it functions not very well, <laughs> but it functions. Most governments don't function very well. Okay, but you so, could. I mean, it. Uh, the, we're kind of steering away from the Iranian issue, but I mean, you could argue the opposite because it took two years to reach a point where there was so, a government that was stable so, because of yeah, the immense, that, deep yes, disagreement there is. No, and you could claim no, that the current government was 95% formed five percent ego. Of, but you ninety five percent ego. But that's usually what disagreements are based okay. on. Okay. So that's right? how democracies work. How long did it take the Germans to, to have a government, okay? How many elections did you have in Belgium? Uh, how well did the British Parliament work, mm -hmm. okay? We have this problem in all democracies. But don't confuse the political dysfunctionality of the Israeli system with a major disagreement about the essential issues. These are two things. Look, um, Recently, I came to friends of mine in the United States and I said, thank you for demonstrating to me that Israel is not the most dysfunctional political system. Okay? In America, I suggested to friends of mine, to senators even, I said you should adopt a two-state solution, a democratic state and a republican state, because basically you're on the verge of a civil war in America between Democrats and, and Republicans. In Israel, the situation is 100 times better than in the United States. Because in Israel, people speak to each other even mm -hmm. when they disagree. Do they curse each other? Yes. Do they push each other off the road? Yes, this is the Israeli way of pastime. Okay? But when it comes to the crucial issues, the overwhelming majority of Israelis, those who really make Israel, namely everybody except Arabs and ultra-Orthodox, okay? The real Israel. You just wiped out 40% of the people. First of all, it's not, okay, it's not 40%, but say, it doesn't matter. We are responsible for everything good in Israel, okay? Everything that functions. We defend Israel, we build Israel. The, we, we shrink and shrink and, and shrink. We don't shrink so much. We have the largest number of children of any secular, well-to-do society in the world, okay? And I'm speaking now excluding the Haredim and the Arabs, okay? Mm -hmm. We are close to three children per family, which is twice the number in Europe and one-third more than in the United States. So we're not shrinking. We're working very hard in the bedroom in order to not shrink, okay? Yeah. Maybe... One last question, maybe something, may I hopefully something a bit optimistic, but I, I want to speak for By a the moment. Way, everything I said so far is of optimistic. Of course, of course. <laughs> no, I'm serious. If you, if this did not come through, I didn't do a good job. I'm something, saying something about the next war being devastating and so, uh, having a nuclear Iran. So kind of uh, so rings pessimistic. So, look. May I tell a joke? Yes, yes, absolutely. I love it. I told it so often because it reflects Israel. Stories that one day the Almighty gets sick and tired with the human race, and he says, I'm going to bring a flood, but this time no Noah, no ark, no olive branch, no nothing, just flood. And then he calls the three leaders of the monotheistic religions, and they go tell your people that in, three, in two weeks everything is over. So the Christian comes to his kind and he says, guys, we have to pray, we have to do good deeds. Maybe, you know, God will reconsider. The Muslim comes and says, oh, it's because of colonialism and occupation and we are not responsible and we always did the right thing, so let's continue and enjoy each other's company as they do in the Middle East. And then the Jew comes to his guys and he says, guys, we have two weeks to learn how to live underwater. <laughs> this is Israel, okay? The enormous resilience of Israel, the understanding that we are constantly under danger. Europe didn't know that it's in danger. Europe would have behaved differently if they knew that they're in danger. We know. We have the enormous advantage of knowing, okay? We have the enormous advantage of not minding, of not caring to give what you perceive wrongly as a pessimistic picture, because I'm saying 
The challenge is pessimistic. The response, when you bring the response with the challenge, I'm extremely optimistic. I wouldn't bring up my children in Israel if I were not optimistic. Let me tell you this, and you know it from your experience. There's a huge number of Israelis who, who have European passports, right? And they can do better. They know languages. They are required as workers. They can leave Israel. Why don't they leave? Ethan has an American passport. So? He By could, the way, I think everybody should. live in Texas should. now and Everybody should have. I, I want an American passport. Known a gun. I <laughs> own a gun. No. A, a, a gun you only need to own if you didn't have the experience of the Israeli army and you don't know that the gun is not a toy. The gun is something you need when you don't have a choice. Okay? But... A gun helped uh, the people in Be'er Sheva a few yes, weeks ago. Yes. This is not having a choice. Yeah. This is not having a choice. I, I own a gun for the same reason, okay? Because sometimes I'm in an environment where this is my only choice, okay? Mm -hmm. But not because, you know, I enjoy guns and no. there's a culture of guns and this, uh, I don't know, ridiculous uh, so idea of celebrating weapons. Each one should have a foreign passport, you say. If, if... I'm saying the fact that the overwhelming majority of Israelis Israelis either have it or could have an access of, uh, of it. And they don't they, use if it. They re Why don't they use it? Look, I have a European passport. Mm. I know. I checked. I can get paid about five times what I'm getting paid here. Okay? Would I live anywhere else knowing the dangers? No. No. Do I enjoy serving in the army today? Okay? After many, many years, we're not obligated to do it. When you realize you have a very good life, Israelis come out number nine on the happiness list in the world. When yeah, but asked, you can be pessimistic and I'm not delusional pessimistic. at the same time. Look. You know, you can be, you can be a crazy pessimist at but, this also. But you know what my advantage is over yeah. you? What? My age. In other words... I've had this discussion 50 years ago as well. Ah. And I said the same 50 years ago and 60 years ago as well. In other words... And it was much more dangerous then. A hundred times more dangerous. Israel was much weaker. The dangers were much greater. We could not rely on the experience. We now know how we can deal with it. Okay? Because we never met this kind of challenge. Did... The challenges of today are ridiculous compared to the challenges we had in the past. Okay? Mm -hmm. Because we were so weak. So, look, when it comes to nuclear war, we will all go together when we go. So nobody will come to interview me after a nuclear holocaust uh, uh, engulfs the <laughs> whole say world. you're wrong. Because <laughs> I'll be steak. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> so, who cares? But uh, well done. Uh, I, I suppose. Yeah. I suppose. <laughs> I always wanted things to be done properly. So well done is done properly. What I'm suggesting is this is not a pessimistic perception. This is a pessimistic. I know how to live underwater. Okay, and I know that after a while, where I live underwater, I take my head out of the water and I have a great life. And we have a great life here. I don't have to tell you. You live here, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have a great life. I wouldn't live in, in America today or in Europe. Okay? I Absolutely. would live only here. Ah. Only here. You want to live in America? Go. Okay? I think the state it's of... It's complicated is all I'm saying. It's I think the state of Israel should give a free ticket to people who want to leave provided they promise not to come back. But no. there's there are other factors, I think, is maybe what Noel is... I don't know. I can't put words in your mouth. But it's complicated because, you know, you have family here and you have things that tie but you down that you don't necessarily... I, I could live with all my family. Yeah, Very but I, I can't. I can't take my mother, my father, my sisters with me and everybody. And my wife would probably not... Now, I'm not saying I would leave if I could, 
But if I could do that, I'm just saying that those are factors yes, and I can't isolate those factors. Yes, but right why now. doesn't your wife want to leave? Perhaps she's more sensible than you Because she has are. family. And well, it's that, way bigger. That is for sure. She is definitely far more sensible than I am. But she has, yeah, she has a family and it's way bigger. She's Yemenite. So to, to <laughs> uproot them, it would be quite an effort. Yeah. And they walked in the <laughs> desert for a long time to get here yeah. originally. So... <laughs> will be very but you, you get what I mean it's it's yes, there's more factors there, than just this what I quality given of life. you is not a pessimistic perception mm-hmm. yeah no absolutely do you think that's the last question and with that we will and do you think there's hope because we, can we agree that in Iran there are good people many not good only people. good people there are only two societies in the Middle East who can really deal with the challenges of the 21st century the Iranians and the Israelis. Iran is a very impressive society. At the moment, it's a problem because their abilities are harnessed by the barbarians. Right. And the regime is barbarian. But do you think okay? th- there's a chance that yes. the people will rebel yes. eventually? Yes. And then Israel and Iran will be the best of allies that you can possibly like we imagine. used to be. Pardon? Like we used to be. Yes, but no, at the time, we used to be okay. We can be much, much closer if they get rid of the barbarians that have taken that but have what's taken the over. split? I mean, how many Iranians what's the percentage of I'm Iran not that's an more sensible? On Iran domestically, but people who know something about the subject much more than me speak about thirty five percent, something like a third supporting this regime. But they have an extremely effective and brutal oppression, oppression system. extremely effective particularly the besiege this is enormously uh, effective but I mean is it not similar to what we see in other s- states in the Middle East no. where where I mean for example in Syria no. the, the the ruling no. faction there no. was a minority no, no no what is wrong in the Arab world is Arab society mm-hmm. the only thing that is worse than Arab leaders is Arab societies the Iranian society is impressive and Mm-hmm. so they're not barbaric no the culture no so the leaders no. are barbaric but the yes. culture isn't yes that's an anomaly yes yes no we had it in nazi germany okay because it was not just the leadership it was the leadership and a portion of mm-hmm. the german people but the germans as a well, i don't know i've It's debatable okay It's debatable. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm too influenced by German culture yeah. when it comes to music, philosophy, poetry, right. and so You're on. You're biased. And look at Iranian poetry and, and uh, their achievements. You have pluralism in Iran today under the mullahs in, in closed places. In the elections. In, in, no, the election is pluralistic after they remove right. everything that threatened yes. them. But if they could, they would be. I'm very, very impressed by the Iranians. And by the way, the Iranians need to be persuaded. And if I had access to all the Iranians, what I would tell them is... They're listening. Learn from the Germans. The Germans wanted to dominate Europe by occupying it and failed. Now they're, they're dominating Europe simply by being many of them in the center of Europe, very industrious, very hardworking. You are that in the Middle East. You don't need to dominate the Middle East by taking over and, and, and throwing rockets. You can do it by simply being better than everybody else. So do it. Okay? Professor, doc, doctor, professor, Never. doctor, professor Shifton, thank you so much. You're welcome. It was, thank you, thank you. Really, we have lots. Fascinating. Of Well, yeah food for thought um by the way your episodes bon your episodes always do very well yeah yeah our listeners love, love you and i'm sure this episode is going to do very well as well yeah it must be the fact that you you don't care about what people think also the you joke you have the no joke. filter why should i <laughs> <laughs> why should you yeah. see i i've been told two things about myself and, and one that i've adopted I say to people, I'm a self-made man and I worship my creator. <laughs> and, and a friend of mine says about me, you're widely known in narrow circles. <laughs> and I think that's a very good definition. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.